welcome to another episode of Science Like Me. Uh, my name is Sara Naderi, and I'm here introducing you to Barna Saha. She is a theoretical computer scientist whose research interests include algorithmic applications of the probabilistic method, probabilistic databases, and fine-grained complexities in the analysis of big data. She is also the Harry E. Gruber Professor of Computer Science and Information Technologies Endowed Chair. She is the Associate Professor of the Computer Science Department and the Halagiolu Data Science Institute at UC San Diego. She is also the director of NSF Tripods Institute named Encore, the Institute for Emerging Core Methods in Data Science. In 2019, Saha won the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Welcome, Varna. <laughs> Thank you, Sara. It was a nice introduction. Yeah, that is. A <laughs> Tell me about uh, your research. I mean, there were a lot of big words in what I just uh, introduced with, and I actually don't know what uh, half of them mean. So <laughs> let's, let's start with um, theoretical computer scientists. What is a theoretical computer scientist? Uh, theoretical computer science is the f foundation pillar of computing, of computer science. It's a mathematical foundation of computer science. So I'm a theoretical computer scientist, so my role is to, is to unravel like uh, the mysteries of like why things work, how, why something is easy versus why something is hard. So to underpin the mathematical foundations of computing. And this is like becoming even more important with the, uh, with the explosion of data and with this emergence of this new field of data science. Uh, so you have a lot of data, and you want to comp want to analyze your data. You want to want want to implement something on your data. But what about like if your data set changes? Like you implement something, you find excellent performance in one data set that you have. But now come the next data set. Will your algorithm work equally well? Like if you understand the mathematical pining of the methodology that's being used then you can be confident that yes, even if the second data set comes, or third data set comes, or thousand data sets comes, like your algorithm is going to perform equally well. So as a theoretical computer scientist, my job is to ensure that. All right, so you're creating like a very robust algorithm that could be able to handle those different kinds of data sets. But can you give me an example of how that would apply in the real world, something that, like, something that a middle school student would understand? You know, like nowadays, there is a revolution in like uh, uh, in technologies that help you to analyze your gene sequences. Okay, so you have your human gene sequences. If you can analyze it, that can help you to detect diseases or help 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 to cure diseases. Like once you know you you are like uh, you have higher chances of getting certain diseases. Like there could be early prevention for that. So now, but this that amount of data, data sets, think about you are getting gene sequence from every human. It's like huge. If you have a technology that can handle that massive amount of data set, that can be really useful. Yeah. But how do you do that? Like, is, how do you analyze such huge amount of data? It may not be, you may not be able to store that data. It's, it might take like years to analyze that kind of data, even with your like fastest whatever known technology. So how do you handle that? So in my work, I try to come up with fast algorithms, like or algorithms that can work with like when the data is compressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this huge amount of data, if you cannot store it just like that in your computer, but if you can compress it, maybe there are like you can compress it and then it will fit in your server. Just not even even don't think about one computer. I'm thinking I'm thinking of think about like many servers, many, many, many computers. Like even that it may not be enough to store the data in its raw format. You yeah. have to compress it. So now if, it, if the data is in compressed format, you are not getting, like you are not seeing all the patterns inside of it. But if I, if I can give you an algorithm that runs on that compressed data and can still detect the patterns that can help to diagnose diseases, that would be very useful, right? Like from taking a, taking a gene sequencing, like taking a sequencing thing to take from years, it might reduce the time complexity to like hours or to minutes or mm -hmm. something like that. So that could be a huge improvement in, uh, in 
uh, like what kind of uh, uh, like treatment can, that can be <laughs> afforded to like people. So yeah, so so my role is to design like uh, understand like the complexity of real life data. Yeah. And to find out like how can we design good algorithms so that they can be implemented in real time and uh, can make a difference. When you test it on this compressed data, do you have the opportunity, at least with not the huge, huge, huge data sets, but like double check that, okay, if I did this with the compressed data and I did this with the raw data, I'm still able to find these patterns? Yeah, th th that's very important and that's exactly where theoretical foundation comes okay. in. So we, we do not, we give concrete theorems and lemmas, like, uh, so we, we do mathematical proofs, which shows, hey, if this works on your uncompressed data, you will, find, you will be able to detect the same pattern on the compressed data. Yeah. If you use certain compression algorithms. So it's like guaranteed, okay? So it's like, yeah, it's guaranteed. I did take one class in compressing, uh, what is it? Was it music or is it uh, images? But I remember realizing, oh my gosh, you are losing some of that raw data, like you said. But, and then what kind of information are you losing when you do that? And it's basically finding these little patterns that you can shortcut mm -hmm. and, and turn into this compressor. So it can travel faster, really. Um, but in this, in this instance, it's also just to even analyze it because it's so big. I didn't realize that there, even even with the fastest computer, you'd still need to actually have compressed data to anal analyze. Yes, yeah, it, it's a big area in genomics, the compressive genomics, how you, how you can design good compression algorithms so that you can really keep this data in a, sh in a way that it can be utilized. Uh, and having algorithms that can directly work on like this compressed data or summary of data, uh, things like that, that could be very useful. Yeah, so what got you interested in getting down this path? So my dad was a mathematics professor uh, in India, and my mom was a chemistry teacher. So I kind of had an environment where I grew up like where they used to talk about, like I used to see my dad trying to solve problems, like mathematical problems, and my mom was like, uh, she would tell me about like different kind of chemistry reactions. Actually, I used to like chemistry more than mathematics at that time, because chemistry, you can see like the, these experiments, like colorful, like colorful salts and things like that. So that was very fascinating to me. But in anyway, what I'm trying to say, like my environment in my house was like uh, conducive for liking science. So it was, it was, so I, 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 I think I was fascinated about science from from my school years, like from very beginning, from my childhood. But I didn't, didn't have any idea what is computer science. Like I grew up in a small town in India and I haven't seen a computer until I was in, until I, I graduated high school. Oh wow. Yeah, I've never seen a computer before that. Computer science was very much like, oh yeah, I hear about it. It's like this new science, <laughs> kind of. It's I don't know what it is, but it seems very fascinating. Uh, and, and what I heard that it's mathematical. So I like mathematics. I wanted to try something related to that. And I heard about this emerging things, computer science at that time. At least in a in small town in India, it was like, yeah, this, that is an emerging field at that time. Uh, so I kind of jumped in without knowing too much what is computer science. Uh, uh, but I really liked it, like nice. during my undergraduate times and the part of computer science that fascinated me is algorithm design because it's very much like solving puzzles, very much like it's mathematics underlying. So that kind of grew with me as I was uh, taking undergraduate classes. That's how I got pulled into computer science. It's, it was not like very premeditated, but it was like, yes, I love mathematics and this is this new area. So let's see what's there in this new area. Yeah. Do you think, uh, do you use genomics as an example of applying your algorithms? And do you think that that had something to do with the chemistry love that you had with your, that you shared with your mom? 
the love for chemistry and algorithms i'm I, I don't know how, how, to, how to answer this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel like there has to be an overlap somehow. That's what I'm thinking. Like, because, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm not thinking about it properly. But um, there just seems to be with genomics and chemistry, I mean, to, have, to, to know how different things work with each other, you have to have that kind of mindset to be able to make sense of what you're doing with genomics a little bit. It, that, that's true. So chemistry was like kind of my first love with science. and and mathematics as well. Uh, so for algorithm design, like the example of genetics that I gave you is one part of my research. It's not like I'm, that that's the only application I'm working on. I'm generally working on mathematical foundations, so the algorithms that I develop it can be applied not just to sure. genetic data, but it can be applied more broadly, like image data and things like that. But yes, like, I think that this love for chemistry definitely had something to do with my, the way I see, I'm, I'm developing algorithms, but I also want to see how it works, like uh, how, what is the impact of it in experiments and things like that. And I, I think chemistry experiments back in the school days was kind of what like uh, connects. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. It was the hardest subject for me. I hardest subject for yeah. you? I definitely like the math and the physics, but the I, chemistry. I have heard that, and it's ki kind of unusual because all my friends in undergrads, like most of my friends in undergrads, like who were in computer science class, they would say, oh, my fav favorite subject is either maths or physics. Yeah. Chemistry <laughs> won't, won't be no. on top of that. <laughs> but I guess I was used to hear about chemistry equations and reactions in, in, in at home all the time. So it, it was very natural to me. So it, it was kind of my first love. And I, I guess like what you were saying, I haven't really thought about like how it connects to what I do now. I wonder, I don't know. Yes, but I, I think there is some overlap to it. Like yeah. the way I, I like to see the implementation of my algorithms in real data. So let's go back, we'll go back to your childhood days. Um, you had parents that were both um, in these in these uh, science fields, but what about what, what? What did you like to play with? Did you have what was your favorite toy? What was your favorite uh, hobby as a kid? A favorite toy? Okay, I have never thought about it. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a in a kind of a remote part of like it. It was a small town, and even even for a small town, it was in a remote part. But that had its own benefit. Like every afternoon, like all the kids in that in that area would come out, would go to the uh, like there were big green fields. Like we'll go out, we'll play. So that was a that was my favorite thing to go outside, do outdoor active, like to do play play like uh, there were some Indian games like which resembled soccer. So we used to play like that, like with the uh, uh, neighborhood kids. And that was kind of the favorite part of, nice. yeah. We've covered your, well, not all of your current research. We can go back to that. But I'm also interested in what you're looking forward to. You are the director of Encore, which is so cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and what that's going to do for society? Yeah, I'm super excited about this new NSF Trifles Institute, Encore. Uh, it's a, uh, so it's, its goal is to, it's a foundation of data science institute. So data science is an emerging area and so you can imagine like the foundational questions there are even more important to understand. It's right now our understanding is very limited. So Encore's goal is to address some of the core pillars, core challenges of data science. So it has like four uh, research themes un underneath it. So one of them looks at data complexity. So this is related to what I was talking about earlier, like about this genetic data being huge in size, uh, even uh, like, and the question, the question was, how do you manage such massive amount of data? Is there a summary of the data? Is there a way you can work directly on the compressed data? So that's just one as aspect of it. But data complexity could be like could could encompass many other uh, intricate like uh, uh, the the data that we have in the real world are not ideal. 
It's just, it's a very it's a mess, like, isn't it? it's a mess. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> it's a mess. So data complexity is like understanding the complexity of data, like how complex is your data and how can you, even when your data is complex, how are there underlying some structures that you can leverage uh, so that you can develop efficient algorithms. So that's one part of Encore. The second part of it is about op uh, designing data-driven optimization. So optimization is a very core area of engineering. It's like all parts of engineering requires to have optimization tools. But optimization tools so far, which has, has been developed, they haven't seen the kind of data deluge that we are seeing today. So this data-driven optimization is a very new area, and Encore's one of the pursuit of Encore is to understand what's going underneath it. So that's the second theme. And third thing is very related to society. So it's understanding like the societal impact of decision making with data. Hmm. Like data might have inherent biases. And if we are not mindful of that, and if we are making our decisions, well, many automated decisions based on data, that could exhibit that biases against some part of society. So responsible computing or responsible learning is another part, big part of Encore's project. Like incorpor incorporating fairness, privacy, reproducibility, like you have to be responsible when you are dealing with data and making decisions about human life based on data. So that's the third theme. And the fourth theme this is though is like foundation of data science is like an inch, like we are, the core team is from engineering, is from computer science, but there are a lot of connections with natural sciences. And this also gives me an opportunity to go back to my childhood favorite, like chemistry, like natural sciences. So connection to domain sciences, sciences like uh, genomics, sciences like, um, astronomy, chemistry, and uh, things like that, uh, epidemiology. Uh, so though that's another big part of uh, Encore's mission. So that's kind of the four areas. And other, other part of Encore that I'm also equally excited about is the outreach effort that we are trying to put in. So our goal is to bring in like future generation, our goal is to, create a diverse workforce for data science so that nobody is excluded to understand and to enjoy what data science has to offer. So we are going to put in a lot of effort in our outreach uh, components uh, from high school to, from middle school to high school to undergraduates and graduates and I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to what that will bring, what impact that will bring to the society. So these institutes are a big deal because it seems like you guys are responsible for basically creating these, I want to say virtual tools, but I'm not sure if that's the right way of saying it, like these these foundational tools that people then can use for these complex data like you are saying. Um, I really appreciate that because um, even with playing, I'm not playing with big, big data, I'm, uh, but I've noticed that it can get really messy. I, I once uh, reverse engineered a heart rate monitor, and um, you know, right off the bat, on a hardware level, you're you're eliminating certain frequencies because your heart rate can only be within a certain range. You know what the pattern looks like, but we don't know what information we're losing by doing that. And so I know this is not as complex as genomics or whatnot, but I just do, I do appreciate that that if I'm understanding this correctly, you're coming up with ways of like taking these mess of a database and cleaning it up, but also finding patterns and ways of finding these nuggets of information that could be really useful. And I think that's really powerful because um, to your point about, you know, broadening the participation of, um, of people into this field, we want to remove those kinds of, those, the biases that can happen if we don't broaden that perspective, which I think is really cool. Yeah, and another aspect of Encore is like, this is UCSD lit, but there are other institutes involved in it. UCLA is a partner institute, uh, UPenn and UT Austin are partner institutes. And with UCLA, I think we can, we can, 
we can do so much in Southern California. So that's another aspect I'm very excited about, like creating a hub for foundation of data science, which is lacking in Southern California. And I'm hoping Ankur will lead that. Yeah, there's not too many universities that have data science like uh, core programs, right? I mean, there's data science programs within their engineering department, but not in, in a dedicated department. Oh, yes. UCS is very unique. Yeah. With, with HDSI, yeah. It's, it's a very unique place to be to do data science. Where do you see data science as a field um, five, ten years from now? One of our big thrust is bridging connection from data science to domain sciences. So I think that's going to be very vital to bring the fruit of data science from engineering perspective to the domain of sciences. The data that we have in various domain sciences, they are very rich but very complex and traditional tools that are available to us are not capable of handling such rich and complex data. So bridging, bridging the gap between what foundation of data science is developing and what domain scientists are uh, Bridging the gap in this expertise is going to be crucial for bringing the fruits of data science to society. And that, I think, is where Encore can play a leading role because of its synergy between engineering and domain sciences. Let me use an analogy that I think, if, as you were talking, I was kind of visualizing um, so far the way that we've been analyzing chemistry or physics or any kind of field really is by, let's just say we're looking at it with our eyes. And Encore is developing a magnifying glass that allows us to really dig deeper into these fields and, and see a whole new, I don't know, layer of understanding of all of them. And it's just insane actually, if you think about it that way, because if, if is that, is that is that a decent analogy? Of you you put it in the you, put, you use the right words. Okay. To kind of yeah. I was struggling to get those words. Yes. Like think about like uh, ast astronomical data. Like there is so much scope for new innovations there. It's about like how can you analyze uh, this this image data for predictions, right? But this data is truly complex. It's coming from you don't know which. Yeah, like it's so, so it's so powerful. I think it is easy to underestimate just how powerful this thing is. Imagine a world with, where we didn't have math. If we didn't have math, we wouldn't have any of the, we wouldn't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> if we didn't have math, we wouldn't have computers. We wouldn't have our cell phones, our smartphones. Um, so this, it's, uh, I mean, I love the genomics one uh, example. It's just like individualized healthcare, you know, like individualized uh, anything, really. Um, I, I don't know. I'm rambling, but I'm 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 just trying to emphasize how we've just like lifted the hood of this car and, and are able to like look inside in a way that we've never been able to. And because we didn't have the machines to even process that much data. There was no real way of actually playing with it. Um, and now we get to play with it, and it's so overwhelming. Your institute is trying to create ways so that it doesn't overwhelm people and that it actually is digestible in being able to play with it. Yeah, you don't see math like in your applications. When you're playing with an application, you don't see the math at, at the top. Uh, in, in the outer phase, but math is underlying, that's running everything. So the math, so it's really important to, for, to, to develop the mathematical foundations, because without that, as you were saying so, so nicely, Sora, like without math, there would be nothing. It would be a really, I mean, there should be a movie or a book about that. I mean, sure there is, maybe. What happens if there's no math? Like, <laughs> what would it really look like? I mean, it, I mean, we'd still be able to have certain tools and whatnot, but not to the precision and capabilities that we have now. Um, and it's just so it's under it's underappreciated. I think I, I know that for me personally, I was guilty of taking math classes because I had to take math classes. Um, and it wasn't until engineering school that I realized, oh my gosh, you actually use all this in these fields because 
because of precision. Um, you really, I mean, at some point you can't work with averages and, uh, or, or even, what is it, estimates and whatnot. So, um, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so, so so I think in five to ten years, like the foundation of data science is going to play a major role in many natural sciences, including health sciences, including astronomy, including robotics and things like that. And that's going to revolutionize like uh, what this, uh, the impact, like societal impact, uh, scientific impacts and so on. So even more of a reason why you need more people being involved in this, why you're so excited about outreach is because of that piece too. It's like you have this huge field that we get to finally explore with this magnifying glass, if you will. We need a lot of people to come and play in this space and we need a lot of perspectives playing with this space as well. Definitely, and without diversity, it's not possible to achieve that kind of perspective. So we need engagement from people all around, like all types of people to be engaged in foundations of data science, and that can bring the perspective that is needed for future, for data science to really impact our day-to-day our -day life in future. Well, I really appreciate your time and you being here and giving us this insight into this really awesome new world that is emerging uh, for everybody. So thank you again. Thank you, Zora, for doing this, and I really appreciate it, and I hope to see a lot of engagement in Encore in the near future. Thank you, Zora. Thank you.